Hello and welcome to another episode of Two Guys in a Chainsaw. I'm Todd. And I'm Craig. Today's film comes to us courtesy of a request from Ryan. Thank you, Ryan, loyal listener. You have chosen Bay of Blood, the Mario Bava film from 1971. Bay of Blood is a giallo picture, but it uh, is a, goes a little further than most of the giallo pictures we've been doing so far. Actually, I would say uh, it is planted firmly in the slasher genre, more so than the oh, yeah. uh, mystery thriller genre, yeah? Oh, absolutely. And that is what makes this movie a little more unique and notorious. Now, Mario Bava is one of our sort of trio of giallo people who were making a lot of these pictures in the 70s. Uh, the other two, we've done movies by them, uh, both Lucio Fulci and Dario Argento. And Baba, until here, this point anyway, really wasn't focusing in on the blood and the gore, uh, anything like this. This was a major departure for him, as well as, I think, a lot of the other films around this time. That, that's not to say that there wasn't there weren't movies that were doing blood and gore. Uh, there were some American directors, H.G. Uh, Lewis, probably the most famous, who almost a decade before this got the idea for making blood and gore a kind of exploitation film that could play at drive-ins and, and be sensational. And he made a lot of money from that. But what he did was, uh, it was kind of cheesy. You know, it, it looks pretty amateurish. It looks kind of silly. This is pretty realistic. And I have to say, as I was watching this movie, Friday the 13th was all I could think of the whole time. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yep. As I was reading about it, I noticed that it is pretty well acknowledged that this film was an inspiration for the Friday the 13th series. I mean, right down to the setting, which is on this uh, beautiful bay. Uh, in some mm-hmm. unnamed place. And the whole setting revolves around this bay and the intrigue and stuff that's that's going on here. Craig, had you even heard of this movie before? I, I'd kind of seen a, it just because I'm into the Jalo stuff, but I never actually sat down and watched it. Yeah, I don't know if I had heard of it before. I mean, the, the title, Bay of Blood, is kind of generic enough that I feel like I've heard that, but no, I, I didn't know the movie at all. And you're absolutely right. I think that uh, this is could very well be considered kind of the grandfather of the slasher movie. Uh, And I was thinking the exact same thing that you were. I mean, it is kind of strikingly similar in style uh, to the Friday the 13th films, so much so that um, many people believe that uh, the makers of the Friday the 13th films, at least the first two, were directly inspired uh, by this movie. I guess there's at least one kill in each of Friday the 13th Part 1 and Part 2 that mimic almost exactly kills from this movie. Um, And that doesn't surprise me because it's so reminiscent. What I kind of found interesting about this movie was that it almost kind of has a uh, scooby-doo kind of feel to it um <laughs> you know there's there's all of this uh of course with much more violence and gore but um lots of uh intrigue and and unexpected plot twists uh and, uh, you know, you just about at some point expect somebody to pop up and say, and I would have got away with it, too, if it weren't for you rascally kids, you know. Like, um, <laughs> um, but it does also stand apart from those movies because um, to some degree, I feel like they were the, the makers of this movie were a little bit more concerned with intrigue and plot. Yeah. However, I also read that I think it was Fulci who in an interview somewhere, I think it was Fulci, I hope I'm remembering this right. I, maybe um, you're thinking of Fellini. <laughs> Fel- maybe, maybe. Yeah. yeah, you're right, you're right. He, in an interview at one point, said that he was approached by a friend and fellow filmmaker who had all of these ideas for great kills, and he wanted help with putting together a script uh, for it, but eventually he ended up just saying, I don't know, just shoot the movie and figure out the story later. Uh, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I, I, I kind of got a little bit of a sense that uh, maybe that's that's kind of what happened because um, I was curious and confused about what was going on in the first half of the movie. And then in the second half of the movie, when things kind of started falling into place, I was like, wow, <laughs> like this, <laughs> this is this is a Friday the 13th movie or a uh, episode of Scooby Doo. Where everybody did it. <laughs> yeah, no joke, right? <laughs> like, uh, like who's like who's the killer? Oh, it's everybody. <laughs> and, and 
And I, I think that the movie is aptly titled, um, even though, you know, I don't know what the original Italian title wa- was for it. And I know that they went through a whole string of titles for the American release, and it was actually released under a couple of different titles. One of the titles that they considered, I don't know if it was uh, one of the ones that actually got released, was uh, Last House on the Left 2, even <laughs> though it has nothing to do with Last House on the Left. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I'm interested to see what you thought of the movie because uh, I was left, I think, a little bit flabbergasted at the end. I'm not sure how I feel about it, frankly. Yeah. Well, one of the original Italian titles uh, translates as Chain Reaction. And I think, man, even though that's not a very compelling movie title, it it sure is a apt description of how this movie goes. Absolutely. You're right. It's it's just a spider web of a plot that starts to unfold. And I guess the thing about this is, much like the Friday the Thirteenth movies, you don't like anybody. I mean, there's no, yeah. <laughs> there, not all of these people are nasty, self interested people with agendas and have no qualms or concerns about killing people you know and so right so you you really don't care who dies in this it's again much like a slasher film much more interested in showing us how people die than uh, right. giving us a care but unlike the friday the 13th movies as you said this is much more interested in actual plot and there is a definitely an actual plot and that is what slides this into the giallo genre you know there is a like mm-hmm. you said kind of a scooby-doo mystery behind it even though it's way more convoluted yet don't you think it still makes more sense than some of the giallo pictures we've seen previous to this <laughs> <laughs> i mean it does that's the thing like there are so m- you're right i mean it is a spider web it, it's it's so intricate and in that regard the way that it's so intricate it's not like it's particularly believable again because you've got all of these people who as it turns out have motives for murder and like you said have absolutely no qualms about that so it, it's it's different in that way but the, like that's also I don't know if it's a criticism, but believability. And again, you're usually the one that gets all <laughs> tangled up in, in believability. I don't care. You know, I don't care about believability. And and the dots do connect. I mean, they really do um, for the most part. And obviously, we're going to get there probably in about 40, 50 minutes. But um, really, it was it was the very, very end of the movie <laughs> That yeah. satisfied me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, like, like I was getting through it and I'm like, okay, okay, okay. And then the very, very end, I'm like, all right, <laughs> I, can, I can get on board with this <laughs> as ridiculous as it may be. Um, but yeah, like I said, I mean, it is an apt title because it is this bay that they're on really is a bay of blood because pretty much everybody you meet in the movie is dead by the end of it. Um, <laughs> Uh, But that's that's all right. Uh, The premise of the movie is that there was uh, this countess. And, you know, I don't know where this is supposed to be said. I assume somewhere in Italy, but I have no idea. And she lived on this um, giant estate. And the movie starts out with these shots, you know, while the opening credits are coming up on the screen. It's just these shots of, you know, kind of this beautiful location on what looks very much like a bay surrounded by a wooded area. I read that uh, they the budget of the film was low enough that they really had to shoot on sets that they had access to, whether it be, uh, you know, one of the summer homes of the producer or just a, a lodge that uh, the director was fond of or whatever. And these exterior shots where a lot of the movie takes place were actually filmed in an area that wasn't wooded at all. And so he just had to do a lot of camera trickery with um, propping up branches and leaves. And uh, I I have to say it was pretty effective. I would have never have guessed that. I mean, it looked very much like, you know, a a wooded kind of bay. But Oh, yeah. Yeah. I guess during I guess during the filming, the actors thought that it looked so ridiculous that they sometimes in scenes would break because <laughs> I, I don't know if it was props people or extras or whomever who were just kind of like carrying sticks around and holding them up in front of people um, to make it look like it was a wooded area. Um, but it worked. I mean, you know, and it just goes to show that a good filmmaker can make do with what they've got. 
I also read that, you know, any uh, kind of tracking shots that were done, Bava just uh, put a, uh, a camera on a child's wagon and just pulled the wagon along. And and it doesn't look like that. I mean, oh. it, do, it it's very entrenched in the 70s. It looks like a movie from the 70s. But I wouldn't have guessed that it was made on such a, a low budget because uh, it, it works pretty well. In the opening scene, we see this countess. She's in a wheelchair. She's kind of um, wheeling around her big estate. And it looks like she lives in luxury. And, you know, it's a nice big place. And at some point, you know, there's a close up of her face. And she kind of gasps like, <gasps> like she, you know, she sees something frightening. And then we see a noose uh, go over her head. And her wheelchair gets kicked out from underneath her. Um, and she ends up hanging, which I thought was actually really creative and inventive. I, I don't yeah. think I've ever seen that. You know, if if she's paralyzed from the waist down, there would have been nothing that she could have done. I mean, she's not actually hanging with her feet dangling. You know, she's just kind of near the ground, but um, she can't get herself up. And she strangles to death. And at this point, I was very much... I didn't know this was a uh, Giallo film, um, but at this point, I realized that it must be because we get that classic Giallo shot of the killer, you know, in nondescript, like a suit and black gloves. And I thought, oh, here we go. Here's another one of those Giallo picks where, you know, we have to figure out who the killer is. And then it kind of subverted my expectations when yeah. it panned all the way up past the gloves and showed the guy uh, who killed her. And yeah. I was like, wow, do, are we going to know throughout the course? of the movie who the killer is but as it turns out we do not because as the guy who killed the countess uh who turns out to have been her husband as he's kind of setting the scene to make it look like a suicide somebody shows up and stabs and and kills him um and it's the very classic you know giallo kind of really really red like you know bright red not even necessarily realistic looking red yeah. blood um that spatters all over the place and though i had expected this to be somewhat typical or similar to the giallo films we'd seen right from the beginning it really kind of started to subvert that and that had me intrigued so i was interested to see where this was going to go you're right and it was very deliberate because as the camera pans up and you see those black gloves he he pauses for a moment actually takes those gloves off before it comes up to his face it's like he's it's like the director is telling you right there this is not going to be your typical picture yep. <laughs> it was really good so the man who was stabbed to death is Filippo Donati uh, and his mm -hmm. countess. Uh, I don't know if I ever got her name. Uh, so they're both dead. And the next shot is a couple in bed. And that's the thing. You really have to – the nice thing about this movie is that everybody looks different enough and their things are spaced out enough that you just – are okay with keeping track of who's who. Uh, I mean, I was taking notes anyway, but as the picture went on with a movie like this that ends up having a huge cast and a lot of people to keep track of, they kind of keep all the characters in these little niches and in their own environments enough so that you never really confuse who's who. Um, this is a guy mm -hmm. named Frank, and uh, he's in bed with Laura, who turns out to be his secretary. Uh, and they're in this awesome, like, 60s-era house like <laughs> with the decor and the artwork you can tell this guy's got some money too and he's apparently an architect and they're chatting a little bit and you realize that he's chatting about the countess's death and how he's going to go and have somebody sign something and this is going to make things a lot easier now uh, and he leaves and takes off and then immediately we get another shot of a of close-up of this guy like chewing on a looks like a fish but it turns out to be a squid and tossing it in the lake and pan back out of that and it's a guy named simon who is in a boat and the camera then does this thing that the camera does a lot in this movie and that is it likes to start in a close-up on something and oftentimes out of focus and then it comes into focus slowly so we can see what we're seeing and then it slowly pans out so we get a better idea of what it is we're seeing and then the camera likes to move, just like zoom out and pan through the environment slowly. And the effect that this has is, 
I'm kind of looking. I, I don't know. I'm, I was kind of on the edge of my seat waiting for something significant, you know, to show up in frame. Mm-hmm. And, and he does this a lot and at very suspenseful moments in the movie. This isn't one of those suspenseful moments, but this is really setting you up for this camera move, which happens a ton. And I'm sure that a lot of it is because of his budget. You know, if he if he didn't have the money for a big, expensive setup or he also didn't have the money for big, expansive sets, he had to get creative. And so a lot of this camera work comes out of that. But then it ends up giving the movie a real distinct feel and I think started to effectively add to the tension when, it's, when it was really used well. Uh, it pans slowly through the woods and then goes up to... Uh, and we see like a close up on some eyes that are looking through a tree and it's it's a guy who's clearly watching the scene and then you see a point of view of this guy's view and there's another guy running and he's running across the bay with a net towards Simon and they have a little exchange this guy and Simon this guy's name is uh, Paul Vasati and he's mm-hmm. hun- he's hunting insects uh, that is his thing he seems to be like an amateur scientist or maybe he's a real scientist but bugs are his thing uh, what is that called um Etymology. Oh, God, I was afraid you were going to ask that. Entomologist, uh, is that ed- right? Yeah, I think you're right. Yeah, entomologist. All right, we'll never use that word again in case it's wrong. <laughs> <laughs> He's a bug scientist. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> He's a bug catcher. And it's a little goofy. He's like, I see you're still chasing that insect. Yeah, it's the one that I you know, caught, bagged, and tagged, and then released so that I could explore and see what he does. And I'm thinking, how on this huge bay in this forest are you going to be able to track down a tiny little insect like this? You've changed, you know? Why? Ever since the Countess was murdered. It is suicide, Mr. Fassati. Suicide. The police said suicide. Oh, of course, of course. I'm sorry. Mm. It was a slip. So right away you wonder, does Paul know something? And then Simon taking such immediate offense to it, you kind of wonder what's going on there too. And then it cuts from here to a great shot of these teenagers in a car, which is total classic slasher movie. Yeah. Four teenagers, and the camera work is really kinetic here. I mean, they're they're in a – it's a convertible. I don't know what kind of car this is, but – person who knows cars that would probably know what this is a very distinct car and they're running through and they're excited and we spend about the next 20 minutes with these four kids mostly it turns out that they are just coming to the bay to hang out and at first you think oh they're friends or they're here on vacation or maybe one of them has a cabin here but no it seems like two guys who who literally just picked up two women that they don't really even know and they're just out to get laid and have fun Mm -hmm. and so they disembark from the car and they start wandering around all these different locations and they kind of have this function of introducing us to all the locations in this movie but this is where you really start to get a sense that this bay uh, as beautiful as it is and as nice as this little mansion is on the on the edge of it that it's really filled with a lot of decrepit abandoned areas like a resort that at one time uh, was booming and now is not or I think as we later find out, uh, there was an attempt to make the bay kind of a resort, but that ended up falling a little flat because the countess who, own, and who owns the whole area really didn't want that. So they go in, and, and they're bouncing around. And I, I love the music. <laughs> I, I actually like the music yeah. of this era. You know, and it's just really fun, jazzy, kind of um, boppy, almost uh, – bossa nova at times right it was also you know in 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 a lot of places it was almost symphonic like somebody would get murdered brutally and then there would be this beautiful sim- symphonic music just like <laughs> oh now we'll look at the bay like, <laughs> <laughs> it was weird and i have to say you know all this stuff that you're describing you have described it very well i mean the the series of events that happens but i was getting so confused yeah because they were introducing so many characters and they weren't introducing them by name like in my notes i'm like squid eating guy bug yeah. guy like <laughs> you know like who are these people and then there's you know the like you said there's a man and a woman watching all of this going on and That's i didn't right. know who they were and then it cuts to um these kids and we have no idea who these kids are and you know we call them kids as is usually the case of course the actors uh looked much older than they were probably supposed to be um but you know it and and you're right it almost felt like a a hostile type situation where these two guys are traveling around together just trying to pick up 
chicks who were also traveling around together. And it, it was just kind of bizarre. Like I, I, I couldn't figure out what was going on really. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> It's it's confusing because you're getting so many characters thrown at you, and you're you're, you're waiting for the connection, and you're not seeing it yet. Simon, oh. like he was biting a squid, and like like why? Like <laughs> <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> like I didn't even understand it, and I felt like he uh, kind of explained it to the bug guy. He was like, "Well, at least I eat the things I kill," and like I'm thinking, okay, maybe that's supposed to be significant and like the bug guy mr fazadi or whatever his name is um you know he's looking for this one particular bug and like it's this bug that has eluded him or something and then later on in the movie like he's got all these bugs and like he has one that's his pet and i'm I, like like a cockroach that he carries around a little box that his pet is his pet yeah. and like i felt like i should be understanding why this is relevant mm. but even in the end I had no idea yeah. why why these things were relevant or if they were. And if they were, it totally went over my head. Well, um, I guess maybe it was just supposed to be the quirks of the characters. I don't know. I, I kind of felt like maybe they were deliberate red herrings, you know, things that were yes. thrown in. And that, that might be what they are. Um, but you're right. It's like a, you get a sense that it, maybe everything is supposed to be significant. You're just confused right. <laughs> as to how at this point. It really focuses you in on the movie, though, doesn't it? I mean, I don't think it's so confusing that you kind of throw your hands up in the air and lose interest. Or or, or was that what happened for you? No, I didn't lose interest. But that's really kind of when I started to feel like, oh, it's it's really Scooby-Doo. Yeah. Um, because, <laughs> you know, in those, in those old – and I love Scooby-Doo. That was one of my favorite shows when I was a kid. But it, it was – I think you're right. It was Red Herrings, and I think that that's what it was intended to be. And to be fair – it played out in a way that I didn't expect. Now, I don't know if it's entirely logical or feasible, but it was unexpected for me. And, and uh, it, I don't know, maybe I'm giving myself too much credit, but I feel like generally I can kind of figure out what's going on. And in this movie, I, I did not. <laughs> yeah, no, <you're... laughs> I had no idea what was going on. <laughs> you're not alone. I was the same way. And I was taking furious notes. I've got this huge piece of paper and I'm like, this must be important. Who's this guy's name? And I went back and I'd fill people's names in, you know, just so we could talk yeah, about me it. Too. <laughs> <laughs> But I think if you're watching the movie, you're not worried about talking about it for a podcast later. <laughs> yeah. you, you won't have any trouble keeping track of who's who. Right. So these youngsters are hanging out, and they're at this abandoned nightclub, but then there's an eye. You know, there's always this, this eye shot that somebody is watching, yep. them, but you don't know if it's a man, you don't know if it's a woman. And then, like you said, it immediately it jumps to a tarot reader, somebody who's putting down tarot cards. And we get yet another yep. character who's just like... This this middle aged woman, and uh, she's finding something significant in the tarot cards, and she walks around through the house to call Paul, and you realize, okay, Paul is her husband, and so you get this contrast. There's this mystic woman here who's uh, thinks there are ominous things happening in the bay, and then her very serious scientist husband who's studying the bugs, and they clearly don't really get along or even talk much. <laughs> you little hateful furdy. <laughs> It would be absurd to pretend that you are capable of loving something. <laughs> Me? I love many things, but you could never understand. Uh, we can't uh, understand anything, right, Ferdinando? <laughs> the clouds are swirling. There will be tears shed over the bay. Really? Oh, good Lord, just think of that, Ferdinando. And now what? Last week, you said that everything was going to be wonderful and beautiful. <laughs> this week, everything's mm -hmm. going to be terrible and horrible. So, uh, But then Paul makes some ominous words here, too. He complains about Frank, the mm -hmm. architect that we saw several scenes back. You hate Ventura for the exact same reason, dear. You hated Federica's husband. Because he knows how to enjoy life. And you don't be careful. You'll spill the acid. And the only reason I hate him is because he wants to transform the bay into a sea of cement. But I won't let him, even if I have to. And then we're back with the kids for pretty much uh, the next right. 15 or 20 minutes. And, and right. I, 
I, I this part is t- it's so Friday the Thirteenth. <laughs> like this was a yes. Mini- oh my god, <laughs> it's a mini movie in and of itself. It's these people who are these kids who are just running around. They're breaking into houses, right? They're right. They're, the one girl, Broomhilda, wants to run off and swim. <laughs> Nobody else wants yeah. to swim. They keep referring to her as the German girl. One guy says, you're getting the kraut girl. Remember, I'm getting the... <laughs> <laughs> they, they clearly don't even know these girls' names. It's, it's right. so funny. Oh, and they're all in sweaters and coats. <laughs> <laughs> and she just goes and takes off all her clothes <laughs> and jumps in the lake, uh, oh, which I thought right. was... Uh, pretty funny. I was I was waiting for her to get killed. I thought, oh, woman goes off on her own, strips down, jumps oh, in yeah. the lake, and uh, and so she does that while the rest of them are breaking into this house. And it turns out the house they're breaking into. At first, I thought, well, maybe this is another abandoned location, but it turns out it's Frank's house. And they're drinking the alcohol, and they're turning on the music, and they're dancing without a care at all. And then the two guys are fighting over who's going to get this girl, and that's the point at which mm-hmm, the saying. French girl, right? Yeah. <laughs> In the meantime, we switch back to the uh, to Hilda, who is swimming around in the lake naked, and I'm waiting for her to get it. But as she swims up to the dock, uh, her foot hooks on like a rope, and yeah. it's kind of a neat scene where, unbeknownst to her, she's pulling this this body that's been tied down up toward the surface, and the hand of it comes and brushes up against her, which scares her and, and sends her running. She's running uh, back to where she last left them, which is at the uh, lodge, uh, was a ni- abandoned nightclub or whatever. And I guess she's, right. she's naked. Did she ever throw clothes back on or she? She did. Oh, she, yeah. <laughs> she, she threw her teeny, teeny, tiny little dress that didn't fit her at all. <laughs> <laughs> she, she threw it back on, but not her panties. And that's so funny. I mean, these are the little details that I notice. you know, like when she goes and she gets undressed, she takes off her dress and she takes off her panties. And then of course, um, when she gets out of the water she throws her dress back on and she's scared so it makes sense but all the time i'm thinking oh she didn't put on her panties and that dress comes up to like her waist (laughs) like 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 it wasn't covering the lower half of her body at all and she's she's running um back to the house and you know it is it's classic friday the 13th like she's getting close but you know somebody's following her and she's almost there and then somebody gets her from behind with like a machete and and cuts her throat and um the practical effects uh in the movie are pretty typical of a giallo film or at least the ones that we've watched because i haven't seen nearly as many as you um but they're pretty darn good um you know it's all practical no cgi so it's all done with makeup and prosthetics and stuff um and it's good and and she just ends up laying there on the lawn and is dead and then uh the other folks the other kids that are still inside i think it was duke and denise the french girl (laughs) they go off and start having sex they go off and start having sex in a bedroom and so bobby the other guy is alone and i feel like maybe he hears something so he goes to the door and immediately he gets like a meat cleaver or a machete to the face um, and like you know almost cuts his cuts his head almost perfectly in half and then immediately Immediately, I mean, like within seconds after that, we get one of the classic Friday the 13th kills where Denise is on top of Duke and they're having sex, of course, in a bed and they're naked um, and they get speared through both of them and it goes all the way through the bed and you see the spear coming down through the bed. And I feel like that was recreated almost exactly in one of the Friday the 13th films. And then I, I understand why, you know, it's, it's gross and scary and, and effective. Um, the thing that I, you know, looking back on it now, I enjoyed the part with the kids because it was reminiscent of the movies that I watched when I was a kid. I liked the Friday and I still do. I like the Friday the 13th series. It's not the smartest series, but creative and interesting kills. And so I appreciated those elements, but I also, having watched it and then going to read about it, I almost felt like this part of the plot was just inserted yeah. so that they could have more kills. Oh, I mean, it, it's really, it, it's, it's completely inessential. And when it comes right down to it, I didn't realize it was Frank's house. I was thinking that it was the Countess's estate that they broke uh, into. But you're right. It, you're right. It was Frank's house. So, you know, the, it was fun to watch. But really, Frank could have just showed up and said, get out of here. Yeah, <laughs> you know? yeah exactly. Like, <laughs> there, was really, there was really no reason to slaughter these kids. Yeah. But it was fun to watch. 
Well, you're yeah, right. And, and the, in that case, the slaughters themselves become kind of a red herring because you think, okay, well, maybe we're dealing with a serial killer who doesn't have a motive. Or maybe these kids are finding out right. what they shouldn't or whatnot. But you're right. It was totally unnecessary for these guys to die. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you could cut them out of the film completely. And the only thing that we wouldn't have is bodies to discover later. That is right. it. <laughs> exactly. But, you know, the way that this was filmed was still really quite good. I thought that when Hilda is running back to the house, he really gets this effect that she's being pursued by shadows. You know, instead mm-hmm. of of showing us the legs of the killer, the arms of the killer kind of behind her, you just every now and then in the foreground crossing like, as say maybe she's in the background running, in the foreground you see just like a shadow go across, you know, something, a tree or, or a piece of furniture or something. It does a really good job, I thought, of creating this tension and this pursuit without ever showing you a little bit of the killer's body, you know? Uh, It was was pretty well filmed, I thought, and especially so considering apparently they weren't really in a very wooded area. uh, You really get the sense that she's going through the woods from one location to this house and then gets hacked right there in the yard and then is left there in the yard almost to morning. <laughs> then, you know, nobody right. notices. It's, it's, it's really, again, that very bleak kind of slasher movie feel to it. And something that might confuse people as they're watching this is that there's a lot of day for night shooting going yes, on here. Yes, a um, lot. I a noticed t- that too. Yeah. So there are times when you think maybe it's, it's the sunrise or you maybe think that it's morning again, but actually then the next shot you see is clearly night. And so you realize that previous shot was just a day for night. So that it, it honestly, it's not that confusing once you get adjusted no. to it, but, um, but it is there. Yeah. And, and I would say, you know, like, like we said, you know, this is kind of a predecessor of um, the American slasher films that we got in the early eighties, especially it, re- that chase scene in particular reminded me, it did remind me of last house on the left. Mm. Um, and it also reminded me of um, I spit on your grave. Oh, yeah. uh, it, it had a similar quality. Quality, and I'm sure that that has to do a lot with the time period and and the film that they had available. But it was really reminiscent of those. Yeah, and it, and it was um, it was suspenseful. You know, it was it was good. I, you know, I didn't know what was going to happen. I, I figured she was going to get killed. I figured all these kids were going to get killed. <laughs> the second I saw them, the second I saw them, I knew they were all dead meat. Um, and, and and that was you know that was fine. I and like you said earlier, there's really nobody likable in the movie, so you're kind of waiting for people uh, to get killed. Um, and and it pays off in spades. You do get some very bloody, very gory and violent kills, and then I feel like. So Mrs. Fazzati, you know, is doing more tarot readings and it's all very heavy handed. You're seeing like the death card and whatnot. Um, But then we cut to that couple who we saw watching Simon and Paulo. And it turns out that they are Albert and Rennie. Um, And Rennie, the woman, is the daughter of the miss of, of the countess's missing husband. And they 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 have kids. I mean, it's just like it's just kind of a throwaway <laughs> thing. Oh, oh, we're we're leaving the kids in the camper, and and you kind of see the kids silhouette in the camper, and they go off, and they go to talk to who do they go to talk to? Do they go to talk to the Fazadis, uh, um, Mister and uh, yes. Paulo and Anna. Is that yes. they go talk to? They go to talk yeah. to the Fazadis. Yes. It turns out that. Uh, the countess's husband, who was Rennie's dad, had planned to ter- turn the bay and the countess's estate into a resort, but she didn't want to do that. And they think that maybe that's why she ended up dead. And they, if I remember correctly, they kind of suggest. Rennie says that she's just there to find her missing dad because her dad has been missing since the countess uh, died. Um, She says she's there, but they kind of suggest that maybe she's there to claim the inheritance of the estate. Inheriting isn't always so easy. Maybe Federica's will leaves everything to her illegitimate son. Her illegitimate son? (laughs) Your stepmother did have her brighter moments. Didn't you know that Simon is the offspring of her secret affair? Uh-huh. But who is this Simon? Oh, he's a fellow who lives here in the shack on the bay. He's part watchman, part fisherman, and even part petty thief. Anna, 
who is the squid biter. Um, <laughs> Simon and, the squid biter. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like a great. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that sounds like a good movie on its own. We should yeah. watch that one next. <laughs> um, so Rennie and Albert are going to go see Simon. Well, when they go to see him, um, we see that Frank has been visiting Simon and is now leaving um, and actually gets out of there before Rennie and Albert realize he's there. And as he's leaving, he says to Simon something like, well, we'll settle tomorrow. So we know there's something going on with Frank and Simon. We don't know exactly what. We know that Frank wants to get his hands on the estate. So there's something going on there. And so the so Rennie and Albert are talking to Simon and they're asking about the dad. They follow him out to the docks in the bay. And he's like, nope, I don't know anything. And then Rennie just kind of looks looks off to her side and sees something moving under a tarp and she throws the tarp aside and underneath the tarp is her dad is her dead decaying dad with a squid on his face um, <laughs> and and she's like i thought you said you didn't know what happened and simon's like oh i found him in the sea like <laughs> oh wait yeah i just, i forgot to mention i found him um, not and, suspicious at and all. and that's really no, not suspicious at all. Then uh, Albert and Rennie go to Frank's cabin where Albert goes off somewhere. I don't remember where he goes, but he leaves uh, Rennie there. I, I think it was another one of those, hey, you go get the car moments. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. And Rennie goes to the bathroom like she's been sick or something, and she's like washing her face, and she sees in the reflection of the mirror behind her all those dead kids that we saw before. And then Frank tries to attack her with an axe. Yeah. And at this at this point I was like, "What? Like Frank is the killer? What is happening?" Like <laughs> I had no idea. And like so he tries to attack her with an axe and she's like holding him off from the other side of a door and she's in the bathroom and she sees these great big long scissors and like she stabs him with the scissors through the door. Through the door. Yeah. And it looked to me like he was dead. Like I yeah. thought she had killed him. I'm like, "Wait a second. Does stabbing somebody in the leg kill them like i i was really confused and and really i guess that kind of leads up i, I would say at this point there's maybe 20 minutes of the movie left um and uh everything just all of the intrigue starts getting explained at this point and it's super super convoluted yeah but it makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, like, it, it's not like it's so convoluted that it doesn't make sense. It's just like, oh, okay, we're dealing with all terrible people. <laughs> like, <laughs> th there is there is no good guy in this movie. Yeah. Um, so I, I don't know. Tell the folks how it all plays out. All right. So uh, Paul eventually – oh, there was an earlier scene where – Paul's wife had been looking for Paul, and he was missing. I think this was shortly after the teenagers were murdered. And uh, when she looks into his office, his little beetle is stabbed with uh, with a pin. Um, I thought that was oh a god, I didn't even notice that. Oh, you that was a really I, I you know again a little troubling um, injury to animals thing because that wasn't a mechanical beetle, you know. Uh, and I think right, Mario. Right. I read that Mario Bava really regretted that moment. It seems like this is a common thing for these Giallo pictures. Wasn't there another one that we saw earlier where somebody had stabbed a, a salamander or something to the ground with a pin as well? Like, yes, yes, you're right. Later regretted doing that. I mean, <laughs> so Paul pops in and he finds Frank's body, and again he's he's Frank's. I think he's laying there with his eyes open. Seems completely dead. So he runs out. And then um, the daughter – now this is the point where we realize that um, Rennie is completely and utterly doesn't care who dies. Who, she, she's got this bloodlust. <laughs> All she wants is the yep. inheritance and the money. Um, she tells Albert to hunt uh, Paul down and kill him because he's, he's – seen this and actually the only guy who's even somewhat good in this is albert who's the only one who seems to have any qualms about killing anybody hurry before he calls the police stop me before he ruins everything albert i can't just how am i going to go on move go ahead <laughs> and he runs off uh and does kill him paul's wife is prowling around and she gets her head cut off you know Actually, it's a pretty cool scene, and you don't know initially who's doing it, and you're thinking, wait a minute, that doesn't make sense. Like, why did she die? And it is a close-up of her neck, like, after the head is cut off, spurting blood. And as it falls forward, there is a... It's basically like a breaking pot. And it's a shot of the kids that we had left in the trailer. 
that just came out of nowhere. It was like this sudden reminder. Oh yeah, by the way, there's still kids in a trailer over here, and mm-hmm. you know they're goofing off in the. But it was a, it was a really cool transition. This movie actually has quite a few really cool uh, transitions, and that's one of them. Then Albert comes back to meet Rennie, and she makes a comment to him, and it turns out it's it, she must have killed the wife. Right. She's killed the wife. He's killed the husband. So now they think that they're fine. All they have to do now is get rid of Simon. So they go down to uh, the cabin uh, to get rid of Simon. But at this moment, then, it switches to a gas station. And Laura, who we haven't seen since the very beginning of the movie, she's Frank's secretary, uh, is getting gas pumped. And she's making a phone call. And Frank, you know, obviously nobody answers at Frank's house because everybody at Frank's house is dead. So she gets in the car and returns, comes into Frank's house, and Frank starts crawling towards her. He's not dead yep. after all. This is the only part of the movie that I was like, what? Of course this guy was dead. Like, three people have discovered this guy's dead body. He, <laughs> he hasn't been moving, you know? His I, I, his eyes are open. Does he sleep with his eyes open? Was he playing possum? I don't know. But in any case, he decides to crawl towards her, and uh, he tells her to go get Simon. So... Even as he's dying and he needs help, all this guy cares about is the bay uh, and getting Simon so that he doesn't get killed as well. I mean, he knows what's going to happen, and he still wants his mon- uh, his hands on this bay. Right. Anyway, so she goes down to the cabin uh, and finds Simon. Uh, and this is, again, this is the, this is the big explanation moment. Yeah. And we see the weapon in Simon's hand. A lot of what has been doing many of these killings is this like sickle type machete. It's like a machete, but it has kind of a, a, a corner to it at the top. Yep. And, uh, we get this, we get the explanation from her and him also through some flashback, which is kind of nice. It breaks up a little bit of the action. Uh, and we see what's happened previously. And in a nutshell, what had happened? What well, I don't know. You explain it, man. Can you explain it? <laughs> well, <laughs> I don't know. I hope so. <laughs> okay. So, so Simon says to her, "You finally came back to the bay, huh?" What do you mean? You and Ventura convinced Donati to murder my mother. Your mother? I don't know what you're talking about. I don't know. Don't what she you is. play innocent with me? No. You no good, no. filthy whore. Listen, Simon. You made Donati kill her. No. You wanted to marry him, you slut. You were even ready to screw Ventura. No, Simon, you've got it all wrong. Shut up, you bitch. You thought you could take my mother's place, didn't you? No. But I'm going to kill no, you wait. like I did Donati. I have nothing to do with it. And then we get these flashbacks where we see both Frank and Laura had met with the countess and had tried to negotiate with her, but she was unbudging. And then we get another flashback where we see Frank and Laura together. And he says, you know, I think Donati would be in for it, but I don't think I can convince him. He seemed, you know, we've been at parties with him. He seemed to like take a liking to you. So you need to seduce him. Um, And she claims to Simon that she didn't want to do that, but she was kind of pressured into it by Frank. And so we get another flashback where we see Laura and the Countess's husband, Donati, um, and he's like, they're in a car and he's trying to, you know, make the move on her. And she's like, no, 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 um, not unless you do this deal or whatever. So it, it turns out that she kind of did seduce him and try to get him into this. And then there was something that I didn't really understand. About the diary? Well, no, the diary I understood. Okay, so so I thought that because there was a suicide note from the very beginning, there was a suicide note from the countess, um, and we see in one of these flashbacks that um, Laura sees this diary and she swipes it. Now, what I thought that she was doing was that she was trying to get it so that she could mimic the handwriting, but as it turns out, there was an entry in the diary that said something like. Life is just isn't worth it anymore. It's all over it for me. Uh, you know, it wasn't a it wasn't a suicide note at all, but it sounded enough like a suicide note that it was dated February thirteenth. And he's like, next February thirteenth, we're going to get her killed or whatever. And and that's what they did, and that's why the authorities thought that it was um, a suicide. What I didn't understand was somehow Frank. After the countess and her husband were killed, somehow Frank blackmailed Simon. Did you catch how that – because what I remember seeing was that, like, Simon dumped a body in 
the bay Mm -hmm. and then frank said something like oh i can make this all go away all you have to do is sign the papers and he did what would you do you know what that was no i'm not quite sure my thought was perhaps because simon didn't have anything to do with killing the stepfather but as far as we could tell but maybe they had him do the dirty work and then use that to blackmail because at the end of the day – I don't know. I think there's a lot of implication here, and and it could be yeah. taken a couple different ways. It could be taken that Simon was really happy that all this happened and was more than willing to help get rid of the body, but in exchange for you know for all that, um, he had to sign over the property. Or it could also be that Simon's the illegitimate son of this woman, and he's not living in the house with her. It, there's something earlier on about how – and and it's also in her gaze upon his cabin. He he's living in this crummy little cabin on the edge of the lake, and it's kind of the family shame, basically. Uh, and so there's apparently a lot of guilt and stuff. So it could also be claimed that now that both of those people are out of the way and everything falls to Simon, that Simon can b- have all the money that he needs to leave the bay and leave this life behind. Uh, all he has to do is sign his inheritance over to Frank, and then they will give him the money basically a huge chunk from it and that's what i think it was he wanted to get out he wanted to get away but he didn't have any money and by signing over the inheritance he got that uh, and was able to leave uh, leave and, and start a new life Th- that was my gotcha. idea but i don't think again that was my idea i don't think it was ever completely spelled out and it doesn't matter because just then everybody dies Simon. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's right or you know laura and simon are having this tense exchange and and she takes a pot of boiling water off the stove and throws it in his face. And you think she's going to get away, but she doesn't. He, Simon attacks her and strangles her and and she's dead. But then Albert shows up, I guess. Well, he Uh, kills Laura. He kills her. And then, and then Albert shows up and kills Simon with a spear. Suddenly. As Rennie watches. As suddenly. I mean, it's, it's like Simon like finishes killing Laura. He walks out the door, and he the door is barely closed behind him when suddenly the spear goes through him right right into the wall outside the cabin. Uh-huh. Right, it's crazy. Yes, and 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 again, I I think I'm very reminiscent of Friday the Thirteenth. I think this may be the second kill that they almost copied identically because the imagery was so familiar to me. Yeah. And it's Albert, right? As as Rennie watches, and then Albert and Rennie pull a body out from the bay again I wasn't really sure who that was Mm. do you know no, I I don't, I don't know. <laughs> it doesn't matter. It could have it been. It doesn't matter. Another Moving teenager. Right who knows? <laughs> um, so Rennie and Albert are alone in one of the houses, and all the lights go out. And Rennie says, "Albert looks out, and the lights and the lights are out, and it's Frank." And Frank attacks attacks Albert, and they struggle. And the winner of the struggle gets up, and you don't know who it is. Rennie's standing there looking at them, but you're not sure which one wins. Um, and then it cuts to a scene in full daylight outside, and it's Albert and Rennie, and they are burning the documents. I guess the documents that Frank and Simon had signed, signing it over to Frank. They're burning the documents. They have won. Everybody else is dead. They are good. You know, they're like, oh, I do it all over again for our children. Um, and then <laughs> you just see the barrel of a shotgun pointed at them and it goes off and they both go down. Like they're both dead from this shotgun. (laughs) (laughs) And I swear to God, this is my favorite part of the movie. If I had any qualms about the movie whatsoever, like, this just wipes them all away. <laughs> it, 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 it cuts to a shot of these two kids in this camper pointing the gun at their parents who they've just shot. And one of them, it's a boy and a girl, and one of them says, Gee, they're good at playing dead, aren't they? Hey, let's go down to the bay. <laughs> <laughs> and then <laughs> these two kids just frolic off to the bay <laughs> while the pretty symphonic music plays and and that's the end <laughs> oh and i have to say i thought that ending was freaking hilarious like it was so out of left field it didn't make any sense at all but it was actually kind of nice to see these people who had been so ruthless kind of get their comeuppance like i was like yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> but it's it, i mean it's utterly ridiculous but i i felt like that was the perfect cap 
for the movie because really in hindsight the whole movie is ridiculous and so then to end it with something that's just kind of so over the top and unexpected I liked, I thought it was hilarious. I was smiling from ear to ear. I like that is clever. Good job. <laughs> it really was watching this movie is so much like watching a slasher because at the end of the day, the um, enjoyment that I guess I could say that you're getting out of the movie isn't really figuring out the plot. It's really just who's going to get it next and how are they going to get it, you know, and, and, yeah. and maybe who did it, but it's not a, a detective story like like we like we've explained. Everybody right. did it. Everybody was nasty. Yeah. <laughs> Everybody deserved what was coming to them. The only two right. innocents in this whole movie are the children, <laughs> <laughs> who then blow their parents away at the end of the movie. <laughs> now, Rennie, beautiful woman, she is actually a former Miss France from about I don't know fifty. <laughs> Almost, almost uh, twelve years before this, and her name is Claudine Auger, and you might recognize her also as the Bond girl in Thunderball. She uh, ah. just just a few years before this, she was uh, she was in that movie. So, you know, it's got it's got a few names in it. Christopher Lee, I was reading, um, was a big fan of Baba's. He had been in a movie of his of a few years before uh, this movie came out, and was really excited to go see this film when it premiered at Cannes or something like that. And so he went to see mm-hmm. the premiere, and he was utterly disgusted by it. Uh, he thought mm-hmm. it was just... He walked completely... out, didn't he? Yeah. And a lot of critics felt that way. A lot of critics uh, at the time were just like, all this, this movie is about is watching people die and really dwelling on their gruesome deaths. Of course, later on, we get a whole genre based on that. So nobody's, oh, terribly, yeah. nobody's terribly shocked by it. But I can, you know, if you transport yourself back to the time, and especially to see a movie like this come out of a of a well-respected director who just kind of takes a huge left and does this kind of thing um you can imagine that it probably got some mixed reviews and and you know people didn't really know what to think of it at the time but again as we've been saying the fingerprints of this film are all over the movies that have followed it i mean oh all yeah over. oh yeah so it's pretty significant i'm really glad we watched it i'm really glad ryan recommended me too it. It's it's not my favorite Jalo movie uh, because it doesn't have a lot of those elements that I really like about Jalo, but um, it has enough of it. And again, it's just it's just a fun movie to watch, and it's really well made. I mean, it, again, very skilled director. This isn't a hack job film. It's a guy who's clearly very skilled working within a budget. And again, like I said before, he makes great use of his limitations, and the cinematography is so interesting it's mm-hmm. different and it's stylish and it adds to the suspense uh, so many times when a person just like opens the door and bam they're killed it, it shocks you and it doesn't just mm-hmm. shock you because of that but it shocks you because of what came before it oftentimes it's this like slow pan of the camera through the house showing you what this guy's doing and then what this guy's doing and then what this guy's doing and what this guy's doing is going to the door and suddenly boom He's dead. Really cool. Really, really good. Uh, There's a lot to like about this movie. Yeah, I agree. I can't say that I loved it, but as a fan of horror, I'm, I'm really glad to have seen it because it feels like an artifact. Like I, I feel like Mm. uh, if you were to take a class on the history of horror, this would definitely be on the syllabus. Like it it really seems like it paved the way for a lot of what we got in the eighties. And, you know, those were the movies that I grew up with and those are the movies that I loved. And I think that they owe um, a great debt of gratitude uh, to this movie. Who knows how things would have turned out if this or, or something like it um, hadn't come around. And, you know, it's got a huge fan base, you know, people, people love this movie. You know, there are huge fans of this movie. Would it be something that I would sit down and watch again? I don't know. Um, maybe. Uh, you know, we've we've watched other movies that I've said, you know, I, I don't need to see this again. But this one had enough intrigue. And, and as I'm sure our listeners know at this point, um, there were a lot of things that I was still kind of left scratching my head about. Mm. Uh, and I think that maybe upon a second or third viewing that some of those things might become a little bit clearer. Um, so, uh, overall I, I would say, yeah, again, thank you, Ryan, uh, for, for suggesting it. Cause, um, as a fan of horror, I'm glad to have seen it. Yeah, me too. Me too. Well, thank you again, listeners for listening. If you enjoyed this podcast, please share it with a friend. You can uh, like us on Facebook. You can find our podcast on 
iTunes, on Stitcher, on Google Play. Please share it with anyone you think might be interested. And also reach out to us on social media and let us know if there are any movies you would like us to review in the future. Until that time, I'm Todd. And I'm Craig. With Two Guys and a Chainsaw. 